Today, I want to welcome back to the show Randall Carlson and Matthew LaCroix. Randall Carlson is a master builder and architectural designer, teacher, geometrician, geomythologist, geological explorer, and independent scholar. He has nearly five decades of study, research, and exploration into the interface between ancient mysteries and modern science. He has been an active Freemason for 43 years and is a past master of one of the oldest, largest Masonic lodges in Georgia. His work incorporates ancient mythology, astronomy, earth science, paleontology, symbolism, sacred geometry, and architecture, geomancy, and other arcane and scientific traditions. Matthew LaCroix is a passionate writer and researcher who grew up exploring the outdoors of northern New England. After college, he began studying ancient civilizations, philosophy, quantum mechanics, and history. His focus became uncovering and connecting the esoteric teachings from the secret societies and ancient cultures that disappeared long ago. He is author of two books and a writer and researcher at Gaia. He is currently co-writing his third major book with Billy Carson entitled The Epic of Humanity. Randall and Matthew, welcome. How are you gentlemen doing? Well, I can't speak for Matt, but it seems it would appear that he's doing quite well. So I am as well, so um, I'm fired up for a good conversation. I'm looking forward I'm to doing- seeing what Matt has to to present tonight. I'm going to be presenting some data because Randall and I are data-driven people, and I'm very, very excited to be here, Chris. Thank you so much for hosting this. And I just want to say that, Randall, it's truly an honor to speak to you to the highest degree. You're one of the greatest inspirations that led me on this path. So to be able to have a discussion with you is, is truly an honor tonight. Well, thanks, Matt. I do appreciate that. And, yes. Uh, what can I say? I'm humbled. That's all Man. I can say. What I can say is this discussion is going to be epic. Uh, Like Matthew said, he's going to be presenting his data and theories on some of the things that could have caused the disappearance of advanced megalithic civilizations and the cyclical cataclysms that may have been connected with the massive resets of our past. Now, uh, this information may differ a bit from Randall's theories, and we're definitely going to get his thoughts and insights into that information. And I'm going to be asking some questions along the way that I have as well. I'm extremely excited for this. And like I said earlier, I'm ready to have my brain melted out of my ears. So I know that both of you agree that, that it was most likely a lot, these cataclysms, many, you know, many have probably occurred throughout the ages, but most of them have been most likely caused by causes that are cosmic in nature, but the the causes that you uh, research might be a little different. And uh, I want to get into, Matt, your theories on what you think may have been connected with these uh, cyclical resets. Thank you, and thank you, Randall, for letting me present some of this. And please please challenge me on any of the data that I'm presenting. And we can go into this discussion because you're an extremely well-versed and intelligent person. And <clears throat> I admittedly have holes in areas of, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a physicist. So there's areas that you can uh, please chime in and maybe sure. correct me if there's a better way to say something, or if there's something that I said, that's inaccurate because in the end of the day, we're coming to a time when it's the age of information and truth is returning. Like the ancients used to hold most dear to them was this idea of knowledge, you know, shown around the world through the symbol of the serpent and the metamorphosis of the great feathered serpent into the dragon. And Mm -hmm. we are returning to those great, great, uh, the knowledge of those secret societies that eventually became uh, largely disappeared or corrupted and remained in some small areas um, like the Freemasons and some others where we're trying to uh, gain that back again. Because it seems we're certainly in this age where of this very dumbed down, very antiquated perspective of when we try to understand everything in our reality, um, everything in the cosmos and, and, the, and what the, the part that we play in all of this. And really, you, when, you, when you leave high school and college, you think you know everything. And really, you've just been largely indoctrinated into just certain key concepts to give you an, an idea of it. But you don't get any of the fill. You don't mm-hmm. get any, any of the interesting aspects of what makes all this exciting. And I know that Randall's probably had countless people telling the same thing is that when you look at 
megalithic ancient lost civilizations and catastrophes throughout time and the sophistication that those cultures around the world, whether it's the Americas, Egypt, the Turkey, the Middle East, through uh, through Iran and I and right down into India and all these incredible mm-hmm. temples around the mm-hmm. world, or get to China with the the Yangsheng Quarry that has the largest single megalithic block in the world. All around the world, we find that those civilizations, in many ways, not perhaps not on a technological level, but on an, an understanding of sacred geometry and the the energy ley lines of the earth and the cosmic connection with everything, they were on a level that we we are simply not at. And that's why these mysteries remain with how how these blocks were moved, how they were built, Mm -hmm. why they were built, why civilizations will go sometimes over a thousand miles just to obtain a specific type of material. You look at the Karnak Temple in Egypt and with the travertine block that's present there, that multi-ton block, which is the nearest quarry where travertine can be found, Mm -hmm. is over a thousand miles away in Turkey. So we have to start asking ourselves questions on whether... These civilizations knew tremendous amounts of knowledge that we simply don't know anymore that's been lost over these periods of cyclical catastrophes that seems like every time one of those occurs, we lose more and more knowledge, not gaining more and more knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's why understanding the ancient past is so critically important because that's where many of these answers remain. And so we simply have to, like Randall said, we have to restructure our education system and come together as a, as a, as a unified people to all have this commonality goal of reaching these higher states of consciousness by coming together and learning these ancient, the ancient knowledge of the past and applying the, the knowledge that we have obtained through technology today. And that's how we can create that, that paradigm reaching, you know, the golden age and reaching this night, next cycle of our, of our story. And so it's, there's a lot there. And uh, Chris, I don't know if you want me to, Rand, Randolph, I don't know if you want to say anything on that before we go into some of the reasons behind this and some of that, um, some of the evidence behind why these um, civilizations seem to have been destroyed, destroyed, but um, just, you know, let me know. Sure. No, I, I, you know, I could interject thoughts as we go along here, but I, I don't want to break your train of thought. Um, you want a good role there. And um I should actually be making a few notes here, but, um, you know, I'll just say this, that, you know, we're looking at events here and phenomena that, that is mysterious. That is awesome. That is stuff. That's really almost like outside the, the traditional, the, 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 the recent paradigms of thinking about earth history. And so it, 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 and obviously the point here is that the earth history and the history of civilization on the earth are, are completely coupled together you can't and and this has been something that that's sort of been a bone of contention to historians and archaeologists and so on that you know whether you're talking about an environmental or a climatic determinism and they've they've not wanted to go there but i think it's clear at this point that the evidence does support the the conclusion that civilizations have succumbed repeatedly to a variety of events and I'm, I'm sort of of the mind that, you know, it's just like, um, you know, the elder priest told Solon in, in Plato's uh, dialogues that, you know, there have been many causes. Exactly. And, um, yeah. and, and what I was saying in early when I, my first comments was that I think that in some cases, these causes are, are connected to, you know, because we can now explain uh, mega scale flooding as a result of impacts into the ocean, into an ice sheet. We can also uh, um, explain the the ignition of tremendous, maybe continent wide fires that you know. So you've now got the, the you know the the two ends of the spectrum where you have the cataclysmos, in the Greek terminology, the destruction of the world by water, and you've got the ekperusis, which is the destruction of the world by fire. But we can understand that in the case of a major bolide impact, uh, you could you could have both. Um, but that may not be the only thing, um, you know, I'm not, uh, I haven't ruled out that, that the sun, does, you know, plays a, a very important role and that we may only be beginning to understand how truly variable the sun is. Um, and then we have to be thinking in terms of the whole heliosphere and its interaction with the earth's geomagnetic field and what that yeah. implies, because if the, um, the intensity of the heliosphere is interrupted that means more cosmic ray bombardment um 
And then we got to get into, well, what causes, what are the sources of cosmic rays? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, we're looking at a whole broad spectrum of phenomena that I think is all interrelated and interconnected. And maybe in the grossest level, the end product may be that there's an enhanced flux of encounters between Earth and swarms of bolides. I think that's part of it. But we're also looking at some phenomena that may be just purely energetic. Um, you know, we might be talking about, I mean, who knows this? I haven't looked into this, so this would be just purely science fiction speculation on my part. But, you know, ripples in the space-time continuum or some such thing. But um, I'm not going to go that metaphysical yet, because <laughs> right now I'm still thinking about rocks falling out of the sky, okay? Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So with that comment, I'm going to take a breath and uh, let's dive into your your uh, research there, Matt. Okay. Uh, and I love how you, you're you so open to the idea that it's these events seem to be mm. multiple reasons why, and they may be all related. And some mm -hmm. may be heavily emphasized on cosmic impacts from objects, and then mm -hmm. others could be related to something else. And that's what the, the something else is where I want to bring in some of my data. And so, Chris, I guess if you're okay with me just taking it away. Yeah, go for um, it. I'm going to start by, as Randall said very, very well, and he discusses, and I love this, the, the idea that these catastrophes, this order of magnitude, the idea that we look around the world at these, at these almost like small events that are happening, right? A volcano goes off in Italy, and then everyone's freaking out because lava gets near a town, and then you have a, a devastating earthquake somewhere, right? On like a seven or an eight, and you get... A lot of destruction because humans are all over the planet. But really what we're talking about here, as Randall has coined, the order of magnitude for these events that we've that we've studied through everything from charred uh, levels of soil around the world at, at certain points that can be tracked for their age to the ice core samples taken from Greenland, Greenland looking at what the snapshot of what the Earth's climate was over the last 20,000 years to everything from cosmic impact impacts that are still historically around the world and things like vitrification, which we're going to get into too on some of these megalithic sites where what we're looking at is these ancient civilizations that go back well over 12, 13,000 years. I'm on, I'm on the mindset when I study this, that they go back over 50,000 years. When we look at like, for instance, we know as Randall said, when Solon met with the temple priests of Sais in Egypt, and they discussed that there had been multiple catastrophes on the earth, we find out an, a date for when Atlantis was destroyed, as in this myth that is um, contended as not being a real and it's some kind of an allegory or metaphor. We find out, well, no, actually, Atlantis was destroyed 9,000 years before uh, Plato existed, which falls right into the Younger Dryas impact time period, which is extremely interesting because then you start to tie in that with the ancient Sumerian and Akkadian and Babylonian stories of a great deluge. You get into the stories from the, the, the ancient Viracocians of Peru when they talk mm -hmm. about these catastrophes that occurred there. And you get into the stories, uh, ancient flood stories from China and Japan. Mm -hmm. And nearly every one of these areas on the world where we can identify this incredibly sophisticated megalithic structures on these lower levels where what we find on top is so much more primitive, we start to sit, we start to have to ask the question of, number one, how many civilizations have come, not hunter-gatherer nomadic groups, right. but when the rise of civilization <clears throat> occurred, with the sophistication found through things like animal husbandry and agriculture and metallurgy and the written word and all these things that have come along. Once that happened, and it's contended of when that happened, but I do think that it did happen in Sumer, but when that happened, how many of those civilizations rose up and then were destroyed nearly, and then another culture came and found those ruins? Like mm -hmm. in a place like Machu Picchu, you can go into the indigenous stories on how the actual, what we think of as the Inca emerged likely out of the Amazon rainforest after some of these catastrophes that occurred and they found Machu Picchu covered in jungle and completely mm -hmm. in ruins. And then they tried to mimic and build on top of those structures. And that's why you see such distinctive um, Masonic and stone masonry work mm -hmm. in those places. And I think what's interesting is that Machu Picchu, which I'll be visiting in, in July, presents one of the best and compelling pieces of data that shows that there's been at least three, three different civilizations. Mm -hmm. Because what we find 
in the areas of um, the royal uh, the royal palace in the center of Machu Picchu, the Torreon, we find this the area of incredible megalithic uh, architecture, precision like we find all around Peru on the lowermost levels. And then right above it, as Brian Forrester has discussed mm-hmm. often, there's this slightly smaller megalithic building we find on top that seems in a very small gap, almost like it only occurred in a small amount of time. And then you have the, the, the masonry we find from the classical Inca, which is more like a mortar type of aspect with small stones and cobbles, mm-hmm. showing that there have been three civilizations there. And when you look at stories like in the Maya and the Aztec, they describe how we're in this age of how there have been civilizations that have come and gone. And we're in like the fourth or fifth time period yeah. of these catastrophes of civilizations rising up and falling. And instead of thinking that it's only been like one before us, we're looking at multiple ones. Now, how far of a gap did those exist before they were destroyed repeatedly? And how far back does that whole story go? And once we can determine that, we can figure out when these cyclical catastrophes occur on a regular basis. And I'm of the opinion that the purpose behind Gobekli Tepe mapping, or the main purpose behind having a cosmic library that maps out the zodiacal great year of the earth is that they knew when those events would occur. And I think that they were planning for them. And the evidence behind that is because they buried Gobekli Tepe before these catastrophes came through in order, in my opinion, in order to protect that library. Because I think they knew they were forewarned and had an understanding that those events occurred. And I think every time those have happened, the civilizations have had less and less knowledge that those things were going to occur. And so that's where I really want to get into. Yeah, go ahead, Randall. Well, you know, what you're saying is uh, that's without actually being data driven, it's purely speculative, but that's precisely what I had speculated because, you know, having uh, one of the things that I've studied is, um, uh, nuclear, um, deterrent, uh, technologies and, and, uh, nuclear strategies. Um, not so much lately, but really a lot heavily in the eighties, particularly. And, you know, then I realized as I started looking at, um, so, uh, cosmic impact phenomena that there was a lot that we had learned about detonations in the atmosphere and detonations underground from all the nuclear testing that applied directly to our understanding of what occurs when an object say uh, for example something like the 1908 Tunguska object uh, comes in and explodes five miles up in the in the atmosphere and what it does in terms of pressure waves uh thermal pulse, all of that kind of stuff. And it doesn't have, it's very similar to a a nuclear uh, weapon detonation uh, without the radiation um, that you would find, the radiation signature that you would find with a a nuclear- uh, Like isotopes, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, in any case, uh, you know, when we went from going to uh, a mutual assured destruction scenario to a survivability scenario that's when they began to harden all of the command and control centers and missile silos and of course what did what did they do with the missile silos to protect them from the surface blast they put them they bury them basically and um so i within that framework of thinking i had concluded basically almost precisely the same idea that it was buried to, and, and this could be to protect it not only from the blast effects, but from radiation as well. So if there was radiation involved and we, one of the things I'm studying right now, trying to learn more about is what we now know about what happens atmospherically when uh, you have a, a major impact event. We do know from the uh, Anguska event that it caused some pretty major fluctuations in the ozone and a multiple impact event may uh, temporarily deplete the ozone in the atmosphere to the point where cosmic ray bombardment increases by an order of magnitude or more. That's interesting. I've never heard of that. Okay. Yeah. So that's, you know, this is stuff I've been considering. And, and, you know, at this point, catastrophism is really is still in its infancy. You know, we've been straight jacked in, straight jacketed into this gradualistic model, this uniformity model, 
you know, for a century and a half, um, it's been the dominant model of earth change. And it's been very valuable, very powerful, very insightful, but it's only half the equation. Yeah, exactly. You know, the other half is, is that, yeah, there's this other mode and it involves uh, short lived periods of extremely accelerated uh, change. And so we have to look where, where within those very short episodes, you may have factor of 10 or a hundred or a thousand times the rate of change that you find yeah. during normal times. So, exactly. so yeah, I had come to that same idea that, um, Maybe Gobekli Tepe was uh, buried specifically to protect it from catastrophic events. The first thing, of course, that came to my mind was a, a blast a la Tunguska kind of event, but also then, yeah, radiation as well. And there may be more dimensions to it. I don't know. That's as far as I've taken my thinking at this point, though. Yeah. So I would tend to agree with you, Matt. I think that's a high contender for... Uh, a possible explanation for why it's buried. Okay. Well, we know, uh, you know, astrology is extremely important to the ancients. <clears throat> it was encoded in uh, almost every ancient text, including the Bible, and they apparently knew the stars way better than we do now. But, you know, what exactly did they know? Did they know about a specific cataclysm? Did they know about a specific cycle? And I know, Matt, you have some theories about what it could possibly have yeah. been more specifically uh, than we've discussed before, right? Yeah, and this is some cutting edge stuff. And I don't know if Randall knows some of this. And so I'm not because he doesn't know a lot, but this is something that's very uh, obscure. And it's yeah. something that I've spent a couple of years studying and really digging into. And I would love to get his, his opinions on it. And I want to present some of this and we can look at it. Like Randall said, it seems like the common theme here, and yeah, don't pull that up quite yet, Chris. It seems like the common theme here is that these civilizations likely knew about this, this these cycles of catastrophe that come through, and they knew that the most important thing that they could do is protect knowledge, right? So mm -hmm. you, you look at the story of Egypt and you look at other civiliz civilizations, were those created out of things like the Atlantean civilization, because they knew that there was a catastrophe that was going to destroy their civilization. And so they went out and they created these libraries and myst uh, mystery schools, and these initiates traveled around the world. And then they created civilizations in order to protect that knowledge. We certainly see that with symbols like the, the pine cone and the, the handbag-like symbol that we see in Gobekli Tepe, Pillar 43. Mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. see in all across ancient Sumer, Akkadian, and Babylon, of these symbols being, this knowledge being passed to a king and a priest. We see it with the Olmec in La Venta, Mexico, mm -hmm. with the exact same symbols of passing this knowledge and creating these civilizations in a certain image. And so what I'm going to be presenting and discussing is that first and foremost, I absolutely think that there have been many, many cosmic impacts throughout Earth's history. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just want to throw that out there. Absolutely. I'm not trying to say that this is the only thing that's happened at mm -hmm. all. I'm simply saying that I believe that this is the primary factor on why it seems like I believe that there have been cyclical catastrophes somewhere between every 13,000 and every 20,000 years is where my data has shown me that these have happened. And mm -hmm. we get that data from some very, very brave astron astronomers. I don't know if Randall's ever heard of Robert Harrington and Thomas Van Flandern, but both of those mm -hmm. individuals mm -hmm. were, were studying mm -hmm. outer objects, outer objects imp impacting our solar system and how those impacts might have some kind of a, a timetable on when they occur. Mm -hmm. And I want to point out that both of those men mysteriously died in the middle mm -hmm. of their, their work. And they were both highly revered, revered astronomers. Um, Robert Harrington was the head of the U.S. Navy astronomy program looking at all of this. And Thomas Van Flandern was a very famous physicist and astronomer that was actually working with Robert Harrington on some of the things that I'm about to present right now. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go into some data, some hard data right now. And I can't wait for Rand to get his Randall's opinion on it. So go ahead, Chris. And I want you to pull up the image that I shared. And I want to go and get a little bit of, give a little background on what this is. <clears throat> so right. in the, in, 19, in the 19, uh, late 1970s and the early 1980s, NASA was really, um, they were concerned and 
uh, curious about why it seemed like the entire ecliptic of our solar system seemed to be tilted on its axis, especially the outer planets of Uranus and Neptune and things like Pluto being thrown out in the middle of nowhere. There seemed to be some very strange aspect to this where something was interacting with the entire inner solar system. And that's the other thing that I want to bring up is we have to understand that there's an inner solar system and an outer solar system, and that's largely separated by the Kuiper belt. And as Randall pointed out, beyond that, we have the Oort cloud. Now, in the in that aspect of us studying our inner solar system, there are still incredibly uh, open-ended questions and considerations when we look at the outer solar system. We know very little about it. Number one, no man, no person has ever been beyond uh, beyond the moon, and, and Mars is like seems like the furthest we can really get. And of course, we've sent probes, and that's really where a lot of this data is going to be coming from. So, when NASA was looking at, well, what is causing these perturbations and these this axial tilt to the entire solar system and all these objects, they were very curious. And so, what they did is they sent two probes out in 1983, known as Pioneer 10 and 11. And they sent them out in completely different directions. Pioneer 11 didn't find anything, so it became something that's not really important. But Pioneer 10 was sent out into the outer solar system. And what Pioneer 10 found, I firmly believe, is one of the most critical aspects that has actually turned into quite a huge conspiracy in my mind on what is actually out in the outer solar system because of the implications that it has for these cycles of these destruction of civilizations and how it's also going to impact our current civilization now. And so I'm going to go ahead and discuss this for a little while. And then I want, I'm really excited to hear some of Randall's thoughts on this because I don't think he's ever seen this image. And if he has, that's great. So what this is, is if you, if you were to go search online right now and you were to say, oh, I'm actually really curious about what Pioneer 10 found, you will find that the internet is literally scrubbed of information it's it's all gone okay what's weird about that is in the 1990s i think it was 1993 it was somewhere around 1993 1995 nasa actually came up with a press announcement i don't know if anyone remembers this but they said they discovered a super massive planet that existed beyond the kuiper belt that was four to five times the earth's size that was actually the quote that they gave where they they said they found this object out there that was four to five times the size of earth way beyond the Kuiper Belt. And of course, I am, just to throw, to be very clear, I am not a Zechariah Fitchin supporter in his work, and I'm not talking about anything like a Nibiru aspect of all this. This comes from something that these objects do, I don't believe, interact with the inner solar system in a way, in a physical way. Yeah, I think it's an energetic way. And that's what I want to be very clear about, because you would have to essentially pass through the Kuiper Belt and all these things. Well, at the same time, Caltech in the 90s started studying the, outer, the Kuiper belt with objects like comets and asteroids that seem to have a really strange ecliptical orbit, just like our solar system did. These really weird orbital tracks that don't follow the models of what we think would occur with having a single star in our solar system. Now, what I want to add to that to understand that people know is that in, in our understanding of the Milky Way galaxy and the universe, 80% of all star systems are binary, and a lot of them are trinary or more. I mean, in the Pleiadian star cluster, there are more than 800 stars. So what we're talking about is the common aspect is that when you have a star cluster in a solar system form, most of the time, there's at least two stars that form in a system, okay? This is the, the most understood aspect. Now we look at our, our studying of our solar system and then we're told in school that we have a single star known as our sun and that there's really nothing to worry about in the outer solar system, right? Everything's focused on the inner solar system. But what I've come and looked at is that that's really not the case at all. And this is exactly what Robert, Robert Harrington and Thomas Van Flanden were studying. This, this is what I believe that something nefarious occurred with them because as soon as Robert Harrington and Thomas Van Flanner died, their work was considered mathematical incalculations. That's what the, the term was that they came along and it was all, all their work was simply mathematical incalculations, miscalculations, I should say. And so everyone's like, Oh, okay. So that planet that they announced that was four to five times the earth beyond the Kuiper belt, I guess that's not really there. And I guess all these other things aren't really there either. But what I've come to discover is that 
what Pioneer 10 found is what may be one of the greatest secrets ever kept from humanity right now. And I say that in a really honest way, and I'm not trying to em embellish that statement at all, because I believe that it may be one of the greatest factors in all of these catastrophes. So let me explain this just a little bit. So Pioneer 10 goes out and it finds all this stuff. And then you go online, you search for it, and, there's, and it's all scrubbed. There's no information about what Pioneer 10 found. It's almost like it didn't find anything. Okay. So I started doing some digging and I found out that there's only one place that exists on the, on the internet where the data from Pioneer 10 was ever kept. Okay. And it's in the 1987 science and invention encyclopedia. And that's what you're looking at with this image on the screen right now. Okay. And I wanted this image up there. So people don't just listen to me and think that I'm making all this up. So to me, well, what happened, right? Well, page 2,488, there's a description talking about space, you know, in general. It talks about the outer solar system, it talks about Pioneer just a little bit in terms of how they sent a probe out and those things like that. But it has this, this, um, this image, this depiction, right, that has the most phenomenal things that it depicts, and then it doesn't talk about it at all. It doesn't even mention one thing about this, and yet the image remains, okay? So I, you have to come to the conclusion that they were told to not talk about it, but somehow the image was left there, okay? And before, in 1987, before computers were really a big thing, that was a source of information, right? So there's, these volumes have existed. Someone, people had them in their basement mm -hmm. from 1987, and someone uploaded this image. Now, it took me months and months and months and months to find a high definition image of this. This is a PDF that I was able to obtain after very, very extensive searching. And I, this is like over six months of searching that to find this, because it's almost like people were photocopying or scanning it in, you know, cause there was a few people out there that did like see this and were like, Whoa, Whoa, wait a minute. Right. What is this? And I, I finally found a PDF of it. And this, the first thing I did was upload it to my, my website. And that's what you're looking at right now is my website, The Stage of Time, because I want this to be known by the world and to be, to be preserved. I don't want this to be lost because it's all we have left. It's all we have left of what Pioneer 10 found. Now, I want to just briefly tell what it found, and then we can get into the effects of it because I want to I have Randall jump in, but then I also want to discuss my theories beh behind how this impacts the entire galactic plane of our solar system, okay? So it, it goes out beyond the Kuiper Belt, right? And it's able to, it has a way to, to identify signatures of objects because a lot of these things are dark, right? This planet that they found, which is what NASA had announced in the 1990s, they're very hard to see. In fact, a lot of times you can only see them if they pass in front of another object and create a shadow. Whereas in this case, Pioneer 10 was actually uh, designed to detect these objects using things like infrared and other aspects to detect heat, latent heat and other kinds of signatures from these objects. So what does it find? At this time in 1983, it finds a planet 4.7 billion miles away that is four to five times the size of Earth, okay? In the outer solar system behind the Kuiper Belt. And then what does it find? The greatest secret, I think, of all time, a dead star, 50 billion miles out. Now, when I started looking at this and I started looking at Robert Harrington's and Thomas Van Flanders' calculations of this object, they thought that this, uh, this planet and this potentially this star, and they didn't really talk about the star, but they talked about the planet, may have a um, may have a an interaction with our solar system somewhere around every twenty thousand years. That was the prediction that they made before they disappeared mysteriously. Now, when I've studied these objects, the dead star and this planet, I've come to the conclusion that I believe. When I look at the data of these catastrophes and the lo location of where this dead star was, that it may have, in um, it may have a perihelion pass, of, meaning the closest pass to our sun of somewhere between, like Robert Harrington and Flannery said, of somewhere between thirteen and twenty thousand years, and that may differ slightly. But if that's the case, 
then at every time that this goes into perihelion with our sun, the entire solar system heats up because the sun will have, will, will have to maintain its equilibrium and will essentially send out massive pulses of energy in order for its in to, to maintain its heliopause in order to maintain its, its, its equilibrium. It has to send out massive coronal mass ejections. And as this object, this dead star goes through its dance. And as it goes into aphelion, meaning it further away from the sun, I believe that you see that calming down, but massive cooling of our earth. Okay. And I believe that this object may, and I'm, we can go into more, I'll go into much more detail in a minute, but I want to get Randall to jump in. I believe that this interaction with our binary lost binary star and this planet is the reason why not only do we get ice ages and rapid melting and warming, but cyclical catastrophes on the earth from coronal mass ejections and, and pole shifts, which have, and I wanna, we can go into all kinds of uh, discussions on what that does. But before I go any further, I just would love to get Randall's thoughts. Um, so I don't just keep talking on and on about this. Well, I have read Flandrum. It's been 20 years at least. Uh, I have one of his recent books, Comet in the title, um, sitting on my shelf right in the other room. Um, so I'm a little bit familiar with some of these ideas. I mean, I've also looked at the idea of cyclical catastrophes. 13,000 year period definitely seems to coincide with your conclusions. Um, because, you know, we look back, if we go back to 13,000 year cycles, we're back at the you know, basically the previous dawning of the age of Aquarius, right? Which is yeah. in the astronomical sense is just going to be the position of the vernal equinox with respect to the fixed backdrop of the constellations, right? But I may even be able to pull it up here uh, in a minute uh, where I've plotted some of the uh, some of the catastrophes that I think have been well documented by looking at things like uh, uh, Heinrich events, uh, Dansgaard Ashker events, which seem to be um, major upheavals, climatic upheavals that are associated with, uh, like a Heinrich event, is a massive disgorging of icebergs into the oceans. Um, and something, I mean, something is triggering that. Um, and there seems to be sort of a 13,000 or 26,000 year periodicity to that. Now, if we go back 26,000 years ago, we're almost within like one millennium of the start of the final phase of the Wisconsin, so-called Wisconsin ice age um, that was preceded, you know, there was like three phases or so in the late Wisconsin ice age, which was oh, after the Eemian, which was 120 to 130,000 years ago, which was considered to be an analog to the modern warm period. You had several intervals of glacial expansion and glacial contraction. The question is how much glacial expansion, how much glacial contraction that is not known with perfect precision, but it does appear that uh, prior to 26,000 years ago, down to perhaps around 40 to 42,000 years ago, uh, there was a major period of deglaciation, um, which we know from pollen studies and evidence of uh, vegetation and forests growing in Canada. Obviously, if you've got forest growing, there's no ice sheet there, right? So it sort of fits. Um, and I might actually be able to pull up here. While you're talking, I'll pull up something. So on your next breather, I'll okay. I'll show a compilation that I did. Um, you want me to jump yeah. back in, Chris, and just keep going for a yeah, minute? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah go, go ahead. For I'll it, have man. some questions at the end, so go for it. Okay. And I'll just expand on what I was doing to, I guess, to conclude before Randall jumps in and we change to a different aspect of looking at this. Um, but you'll notice that what Pioneer 10 found in terms of specifics looking at this object was that they, they didn't identify it as a brown or a red dwarf, this, this, our binary companion. They identified it as a dead star. Now, what's really, really interesting about the term dead star is that it most likely means that the star went into a supernova. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you look at down, if you look at earth history, and this is where we get back into potentially as far back as 60 million years ago. I mean, do we, we look at the, the idea, the, the whole concept of how 
uh, the dinosaur period was destroyed with this massive impact crater in the Yucatan Peninsula, which you know they have evidence of that in the Gulf of Mexico. But I'm always, I'm actually starting to wonder and put this together that if you have a binary companion that's going through an, a nuclear supernova explosion before that event occurred, that star would get extremely hot. Okay. And as every time it came through its perihelion, it would interact with not only our sun, but our entire solar system and affect it in a very, very massive way. And it's interesting looking at how the earth didn't seem to have the seasonal aspects that it has now and how the perhaps something like the great year in the, in this axial procession of the equinox with our, our planet didn't seem to exist. So mm -hmm. what caused it? Why all of a sudden what is, is, did this, this cosmic impact hit the earth and then change the entire tilt of the planet and cause it to have a procession of the equinox or did something else happen? Or is it a combination of everything? That's the thing. Like Randall says, could these objects, this binary companion in this planet, could they disrupt the entire Kuiper belt and then send objects flying in and have, maybe it's a combination of everything, but I'm proposing the idea that when that supernova went off, with this binary star to make it a dead star, it likely was one of the reasons why we had mass extinctions on the earth. Because we know millions and millions of years ago, looking at fossil records, that there have been, there have been extinction level events on the earth that were so significant that mm -hmm. even it's considered microbial life was wiped out. Mm -hmm. So what kind of an event could cause, besides the idea of just a cosmic impact, what about something like a, like a supernova? What if that, uh, that binary companion supernova close enough to impact our entire inner solar system. So anyway, the, the whole idea is that a major event occurred in the past. When that event occurred, we don't really know. It seems like it was likely millions of years ago just because it's now a dead star and no one can see it because not only is it 50 billion miles out, but it's, it's a dead star, which means it's dark. Now you start getting into some ancient cultures around the world who have mentioned something like a dark star or a, or a black star. And so it's just interesting how we're looking at this interaction where if, if I, when I've studied the, the binaries rotation, its entire rotation in, in conjunction with our sun, with our solar system and how the earth's precession of the equinox is a 26,000 year cycle with this tilt of our entire solar system, I'm beginning to wonder if the interaction with this binary star is actually in the same thing, some kind of a 26,000 year interaction. And this interaction with our sun is what's creating this gigantic procession of the equinox with, with the, the whole solar system is impacted through a dance, a dance with this binary. Now there's a documentary that's, that was, that's, that's been made that people should, I highly recommend people go look up. It's called The Great Year. Okay. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. It's not very well known. I think it came out in the nineties. Um, and it has a very, very significant narrator. Um, someone, someone that everyone knows, I can't remember his name off my head, but, um, th there was a very well done documentary and they actually talked about that. They showed the interaction of this binary companion. I was like, why aren't people known about, about this documentary? And it, they actually proposed that the great year regarding the procession of the equinox is based on the dance of this binary. So I'm not the first person to talk about this. I'm just the one going into details to try to figure out how it relates to these cycles. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is now here you have this dead star, super dense object, right? Still has the density that it had, but you can't see it. So you just have this energetic interaction. And I believe that its approach to our sun creates this massive warming, sends out corona mass ejections, probably cosmic impacts as well. And what we're talking about is a magnitude and of, of order of events that are so significant that it's like something out of a Hollywood movie. Imagine you have this binary star, this dead star come within perihelion of our sun, and it causes the sun to shoot out massive coronal mass, mass ejections. Not what we're talking about right now with these little ones that disrupt satellites and internet around the world. How about something so significant that the poles either flip or shift so significantly around the earth that you have every tectonic plate and every volcano go off M tsunamis around the world that are miles high traveling all around the world at supersonic speeds, volcanoes going off everywhere, subduction of plates, 
like Atlantis, sending land masses down into the ocean, like that sunken ruins we find off of Cuba, which is like phenomenally interesting if you look into that, where you start to say, well, we're talking about some, something, an event that according to ice cores, when we look at the Younger Dryas time period, seems to have occurred over like over a thousand year period. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this isn't something that happens right away and then it's over. It's like multiple events in a thousand year period that have different events. Maybe there's cosmic impacts. Maybe there's mm-hmm. coronal mass ejections. Maybe there's massive fires across the earth, tsunamis, volcanoes. How about everything all in that time period? It would explain why these sophisticated civilizations that know about energy ley lines around the earth and, and mapping out stars, mimicking like the three pyramids of the Giza plateau, mimicking the stars of Orion and the energy as above, so below, is, explains why they would have just disappeared at the height of their sophistication. I want to just add one more thing, Randall, before you jump in. Go If you look at if you go down to the unfinished obelisk in Aswan, Egypt, right? The largest obelisk ever created. We're told that it wasn't erected because it, it, it cracked, it broke. Yeah. But I propose that a massive earthquake actually cracked it. And just like we find in China with the Yangshan Quarry and the massive megalithic block there that was just started to be cut and then it just was abandoned. And we see in the Baalbek Lebanon Quarry as well, these mm-hmm. the biggest blocks they were ever going to take out and start constructing all these sites around the world, it seems like these cultures reached the height of their sophistication, not the other way around, and then they mysteriously disappeared. And so I believe that these events are what has caused that disappearance of those of these lost civilizations. Mm-hmm. Well, what are your thoughts, Randall? Interesting ideas. And I think we certainly concur on the idea of a cyclicity um, and civilization succumbing to these events. Um, certainly you've done some thinking about this and, you know, you've come up with some very interesting ideas. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that at this point it's fair game. I mean, we we need to be looking at, at a lot of different perspectives on this, on this thing. Um, so I'm willing to entertain, uh, these ideas. Uh, you know, I mean, basically what it comes down to is, is the idea of a, of a remnant star, um, and whether that could be a binary with our sun. And if I get this correctly now, um, Matt, you're thinking that the, this, that we're looking at presuming a, a, a dead core of a star that went yes. supernova and close enough to our solar system that it was able to disrupt. Now you're saying, but this, this, uh, dark star was, uh, is a companion. Yes. Uh, and it was a companion when it went Nova. Yes, but I'm thinking that it had to have been on epihelion when it was supernova or would have destroyed the entire solar system. That would make sense. Yeah. I mean, if it was, yeah. If, so it must have been, but see, even that being uh, far removed, remote from the inner solar system could still have enormous consequences. Of course. So I'm, I'm, I'm in you know, agreement that, yeah, if there was a, a nearby supernova, that yes, it could definitely have consequences. Now, I had not necessarily thought I, in fact one of the things that i had thought would be the thing that could trigger the uh cascades of comets from the outer solar system to the inner solar system would have been in fact that would have been my most likely candidate would be a nearby supernova Isn't that interesting right yeah however not thinking necessarily that it's in a um you know it's in a, a relationship with the earth that it's a binary um, I haven't really considered that um, too much. I mean, other than what I do recall from having read Tom Van Flandern years ago, but <clears throat> again, it's been over 20 years, I think, since I, I read his book. Um, I might just, if we take a break, go see if I can grab it off the shelf, just because uh, I know I've got a lot of highlighted stuff in there. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting. I'll, I'll pull up something here sure. um, just for a second. Let's see. Okay, where is it? I just he, most, he really only talked about the, the planet companion, which seems to be a planetary companion of that star. That's what's uh-huh. interesting about it. Uh-huh. All right, let's see here. Uh now it, it I, I'm I'm while you're pulling that up, I'm completely open with the idea that it could be an invader solar system. I'm mm. that that somehow got close enough that it got grabbed, or I'm under the understanding that it's it was originally designed as a binary, but then that 
uh, event occurred. And then that's what led to that being in the place that it's in. Uh, also in the type of orbit that's in. But I think we just have a lot more questions that need answers. Okay, yeah. Are you guys seeing this screen? Yep. Yes. Okay, so this is just the zodiacal wheel, and I've marked a couple of points on here, the zero year and then 25,920. So this is pr the present, give or take a few decades, and then one cycle ago, and then a half that cycle would have been um, 12,960. And I'm using the classical traditional numbers here, which are, certainly close enough to the actual tangible numbers of modern scientific data. <clears throat> but you can see here, if we start from here and we go back through, you'll see here, there's, here's the sign, not the constellation, but the sign of Pisces, yeah. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, and then we're back in Leo. And if we follow this axis right through from our present back, 13,000 years ago in round numbers, we're now right at the uh, Virgo Leo cusp. And <clears throat> what I've done is I've gone through all of the literature finding evidence for dramatic climate change or events, Heinrich events, as you see, Heinrich event two and Heinrich, Heinrich event 10. So they both roughly coincided with this period, uh, this uh, span of time of 25,920 years ago. Um, uh, if we go back 2160, we'll see that the, the, the Piscean age was interrupted by several events, but the onset of the dark ages, which was pretty abrupt, the onset of the little ice age, which was also pretty abrupt. Um, we go back here at 4320, we're right within a century of the bronze age collapse. And that was associated with a Heinrich event. And a Heinrich event is when you have massive discharges of uh, armadas of icebergs, primarily into the North Atlantic, because it's it's coming from the Laurentide ice sheet that's covering mo uh, most of Canada and half of North America. So when those ice sheets grind their way across the, the land, they incorporate a lot of the material um, as, as dust and, and, and uh, granulated material, pulverized material that gets uh, broken up material that gets uh, taken up into the mass of the ice sheet itself. So when that ice moves and reaches the coastline, it begins to calve off the margin of the ice sheet, falls into the ocean as an iceberg. It then uh, begins to uh, float to the south. And as it floats, it melts. And when it melts, now normally you've got the very almost like fine-grained marls that are forming from the, the, uh, the little uh, tiny microscopic creatures in the ocean that are dying and regularly and causing thick layers of massive, almost unstratified sediment. And you'll have those that look to be anywhere from, you know, six to 12,000 years, and then they will be interrupted by a thick gravelly layer of coarse, coarse material. And that's material that has been deposited by icebergs. So you've got these armadas of icebergs sweeping out into the North Atlantic. They're melting as they melt this debris that's included into the ice mass, then falls to the ocean bottom and makes a very distinct layer. And these can be dated. And note that's a Heinrich event. And so when you begin to consider what a Heinrich event is, the implications are that something really extraordinary is happening to the planet at that time to cause these, because we're talking about thousands of huge icebergs being disgorged simultaneously into the ice sheet, into the oceans. And then, you know, during... Um, the end of the last ice age, I don't know what part of the country you guys are in. Um, but yeah, there were armadas of icebergs being swept along uh, in currents like that have now plowing huge icebergs, plowing the ocean bottom because they're so big, leaving great gouges in the bottom of the ocean. And they're as far south right now, they've been documented uh, all the way down to Florida and South Carolina. So this is, this is extraordinary. Uh, masses of ice being disgorged into the ocean. So though that's one of the things, you know, so there's a collection of things here, the Alpine ice man, um, his deposition in the, uh, f getting killed and frozen into the ice in the Alps coincided with what I'm calling here, a tarp tripartite climate spasm that, um, is now well dated to have occurred right around that interval that, that he died. Um, 6480 uh, coincides within a century or two 
of the onset of what's called the neoglaciation after the hypsothermal warming that uh, characterized the age of Gemini and Cancer. However, there was a Heinrich event, number six, that coincided with this number right here. And 8,300 years ago, what's called the uh, before present, uh, 8,300 before present cold event. And we can go back. See, here's the end of the Younger Dryas, right smack in the middle of Leo. And then when we get on this axis, which is the Aquarian Leo axis, we've got Heinrich event four. So this number, 12,960 times three, and we've got the Heinrich event four. 12,960, so 12,960 times 5 um, gives us, what, 12,960 times 5? Yeah, 64,800 years ago. So there you've got the Heinrich event 7a, and then times 7, um, which would be plus another 25,920. So that's dated at right at about 90,000 years ago. Wow. So you can see how they're clustered along this line. This seems to be really... Uh, align with uh, the concentrations concentration. Yeah. Thank you. But you can see they're distributed around and um, there's a high correlation between these specific numbers that have come down to us traditionally, like most of these numbers have come through us to us ultimately through the Vedas, but they're also um, important to the Greeks. And they were also found um, Sumerian numbers. The King lists were based upon these numbers and um, we find them also in uh, the Mayan uh, cosmological systems, these recurrence of many of these numbers. Um, so this seems to be a traditional model. Now, what is driving this kind of thing that you see right here? And notice again, this clustering at basically in round numbers, 13,000 years. So that does correlate with years. Now, I, don't, I haven't detected a 20,000 year signal but I'm not going to discount it and say it's not a possibility. I think 13 is more likely based on the data. I would agree with you. Yeah. Um, 19,004. I don't have anything at that date. No, I, I only said 20 because uh, um, Tom Harrington believed that he didn't actually know what the, the entire rotation of that planet was around for its aphelion and perihelion. So he was just giving an estimate of between... He said between 10 and 20. That's what he said. So okay. I'm just, I'm keeping open-minded to not being, I, I believe it's 13, but I was just sort of keeping open mind to sure, got it. what he was saying. Well, notice that it, right here in the middle of the age of Scorpio was the, that was the late glacial maximum. That was when the, the, the last cycle of glaciation was at its most extreme. Um, but you're bracketed like 19440. That's pretty close to 20,000 years. But I don't have any data points for anything that happened right there. Heinrich have got five at 216. No, no I no, think it's not... most likely a 13,000. I think we can both agree that the data points towards a 13,000 year cycle of these events. Yeah. And I think that there's, you'll also notice there seems to be some clustering here around the age of Taurus which is interesting. And then we've got this axis across here. We've got the late glacial maximum and then 13 notice. So if you come around 13,000 years, now you're at the tripartite climate spasm, right? And also notice termination of Heinrich event two come 13,000 years to the other side. And you've got this, uh, a potential air burst. So but, you think it's possible that we're talking about two, two distinct um, time period events within a 26,000 year cycle that seem to occur during different time periods on a regular basis. It looks yeah, like that's somewhere that's what it's looking like, like a five, like we'll call let's call it a, um, between a 4,500 and a 6,500 year cycle. And then, and then like a 13,000 year cycle. Yeah. So if you have to, if you have to 13,000, or in this case, the 12,960, you get the 6,480. And right around, again, and these aren't super precise, but they're within a couple of centuries, which over geological time scales is, is very uh, precise. Yeah. But yeah, you had um, the onset of neoglaciation, which, see, this, this period of time here, not counting the 8300 before present cold event, this was a very warm time, post that, those, that millennia, two millennia, three millennium. Uh, after the glaci deglaciation was extremely warm. Um, and then the, uh, right here at about the onset, as the vernal equinox moved into the 
against the star field of Taurus, um, you had a rapid cooling of the earth um, that led to the expansion of glaciers and several other things. And then uh, 2,100 years later, you had the Bronze Age collapse and associated with a Heinrich event. So, yeah, it's it's uh, wow. possibly some interesting correlations. And but as to what's driving this, see, I kind of look at this. You know, if you say, well, it might be associated with the processional cycle because this is these are processional numbers, and twenty six thousand nine hundred and sixty or twenty five thousand nine hundred and twenty is you know within a few decades of what's usually given as the the time period for the processional cycle. But I'm not saying the processional cycle is driving this. I just look at this as a type of a clock. Something yeah, else exactly. is driving this. And we may have two components here. One, which is the periodic component, but then juxtaposed on that might be more random events, which, you know, will kind of muddy the waters a little bit, but, you know, just make it a little bit harder to perceive the cycles, but you just have to look a little harder. And I think they're there. Yeah, right like that's a that's an awesome model. Um, that yeah. that data is inc incredibly compelling, and I think it just shows us that the alignment of where the the concentrations are of these events is is very difficult to argue with, especially when you're looking at that twelve thousand nine hundred years nine hundred and sixty mm -hmm. year um, mm -hmm. time period, mm -hmm. which seems like I think we both agree that that yeah, there certainly are other times when these seem to be some correlation with events, but overwhelmingly the most significant of those events seem to be occurring on that 12,900 year time period. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like that. Um, but you know, this is a little getting old now. I mean, there's probably new data points that could be added. Um, and if I had full-time research, spend my time full-time uh, doing research, I may be able to add more data points, but, and I suspect that there are more data points because this has got to be seven or eight years old since I did this. Um, and we probably got some more precise dating of the actual events that are listed here. Um, can I, uh, can I ask you, I'm just very curious, um, you and Graham uh, and many, many others really, really talk extensively about that Younger Dryas um, being an impact event mm -hmm. uh, or multiple impact events, we should call it. Do you have any idea um, your theory on where those impacts are? I know Graham has come out and discussed the, the Greenland uh, impact area, but I'm concerned about that considering the ice cap di uh, thickness over that area and, and the fact that it seems like that event occurred much, much earlier, uh, during a, not during Younger Dryas. So I'm very curious to, to hear your thoughts on if you've seen evidence on where the Younger Dryas impact actually was or in multiple um, places, like you could call it. The answer is yes. Uh, and yes, with your qualification, you just said, because at this point, I think there's evidence of multiple impacts. And uh, well, let's see uh, if I, let's see, I could probably just show you, I haven't shown this to a lot of people yet. Um, let's see if I've got it handy here. Uh, it'll take me a second to, yeah. to pull it up. I can go ahead and pull it up and show this to you if uh sure yeah we always uh love to see less love the data lesser scene Absolutely. Stuff, for sure okay so let me just go back to my folder with my powerpoint shows um while he's looking for that i just want to quickly add that one of the most compelling things that i think randall brings up for a good comparison to understand is that rather than the ice age the Younger Dryas, um, the Laurentide ice sheet and, and the European and Siberian ice sheet um, melting in a slow rate. And then the fact that the megafauna in the Northern hemisphere disappeared as uh, attributed to overhunting. I think the more, the way we should be looking at this and maybe Randall agrees is that we're talking about a, a massive extinction event of megafauna up in the Northern hemisphere along the areas of the ice cap on a much more, uh, quick, a much quicker basis than we're taught in school, that maybe these events that have led to these distraction and calving off of the ice caps and these massive floods that have seemed to have occurred and then re refroze and then reflooded again, especially like in the Missoula, Missoula um, flood lake area, like you talk about in the, in the Northwest United States, is that these events may come with very, um, very extreme intensity in certain moments. 
and mm-hmm. having these events where it's it happens so quickly that certain like you pointed out megafauna just boom like that go extinct because of how extreme some of these events um have been mm-hmm. yes some of them have been a very very extreme and i'll show you one thing i think i found it here um let's see here that there i was there okay so in terms of the younger dryas we know that the proxies are things that um you know since something that indicates that this thing happened but um you know it's 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 like fingerprints you know graham hancock used the uh, term fingerprints of the gods for his for his book, but it's like fingerprints that, you know, we're looking at stuff that you don't really readily see just like fingerprints. You don't readily see fingerprints left on the scene of a crime, but you have to, uh, um, you know, use some kind of technological enhancement to see fingerprints, right? Well, the same with the proxies of the, of say an impact event. And what I'm going to do here is I'll pull up something and we'll take a quick look at example of impact proxies uh let me go back to us here there we go scares here we are all right let me know if you're seeing this yep yes all right so here uh, each of these are sites that have preserved impact impact proxies and as it says here ydb younger driest boundary spherals from 18 different sites so these are scanning electron microscope images illustrate the wide variety of sizes, shapes, and microstructures of the younger driest boundary spherules. Diameters are in yellow. So, you know, you've got 42 micrometers here or microns, 25 here. This is a little bigger because this is a conglomerate, it looks like. Um, look at this peanut shell one. Now, see, this is where these microspherals have been melted and then fused, fused together. Um, Through extreme heat, right? Extreme heat, yes. Here, the extreme heat caused this to like burst out like in gases that would have been inside this molten, tiny microscopic molten blob would have just burst out and you can leave this. And you can see here how it's very, um, very clear that it was an outburst. You see how the, the rim yeah. is- Exploded basically. Yeah, and then this, look at these, like this pitcher, like almost like a pitcher of water shape. Look at this here, it has, a, has damage here. This would have been almost like a, a, a micro fracture. This would have been like a mechanical fracturing of it. Um, and then you see these striations on it. Those are from the rapid quenching from the molten state, rapidly uh, hardening. Um, as it says, most spherules are rounded, but there are also dumbbells, bottle shapes, gourd shapes, which is J. This is the gourd shape and ovoids, which is P. Here's an ovoid. Most small spherules are solid, although a few are hollow. Um, whereas most large spherules are vesicular and or hollow. A large number of spherules were cross section. Let's see here. Lachatellerite, which is a very difficult one to say. I did practice it at one point and I had it down, but um, I've now, that's not important. Anyways, flow marks are called schlieren, schlieren, right? The flow marks, you can see the flow marks are in what creates the surface texturing of these things. Here, here you can see flow marks really um, clearly. Um, these flow marks would require heats of 2,200 degrees centigrade. Um, wow. Yeah, so vitrification, uh, vitrification heat enough to melt quartz and rock. Yes. Yes. They were observed in three site from sites, A, E, and M. So A, E, and M right here. Many large spherules display accretion with other spherules, E, M, and Q. So yeah, E, M, and Q. So here, yeah, look at there's fusion going on here where a larger spheral had smaller spherules impact into it, and they were still molten enough that once they impacted into it, um, they fused together. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Interior and exterior compositions of both spherules are similar, but occasionally iron-rich material, which is represented by thin, light-colored bands, migrated or accreted to the outside of the spherule while molten. Um, some of the spherules have high percentages of titanium oxide, inconsistent with anthropogenic, but consistent with impact melting of titanomagnetite or ilmenite. Um, so those are just examples. Then we look here at the um, stratigraphic distribution of the microspherules. And you can see that in all of these cases, look at where the date here is 12.9, here 13, wow, 12.1, plus or minus 0. 0.7, 12.9, 13, 12.8, 13, 12.8. So yeah, and look at these are these are widely geographically distributed sites. Um, yeah, 12, 8, 12, 8, 12, 9, 12, 8, 12, 9, 13.3, 12.9, 13.0. Now, 13.3 is probably an outlier. There's something probably that's biased the dating to be a little older. Um, but yeah, so this is very interesting here. You know, your abundances of spherules by site plotted on a lower x axis in numbers per kilogram. That's what's down here relative to the younger driest boundary depth at zero centimeters. Uh, Scoria-like object concentrations are the black lines. Scoria-like are going to be um, features that are produced in tremendous heat. Um, so anyways, yeah, this is a very interesting table here. Yeah, it is. Evidence now, for do, Can you speak yep. about where those event, those locations are around the earth? Do you, are you, I know they have names like Big Eddie and Blackville. Do you have any idea where those are? Well, this is in Syria. Arlington Canyon is on a, uh, an island off the coast of California. Let's see, Lamel, that's in Belgium. Big Eddy, uh, I should know where that is. Blackwater, that's in southern New Mexico. Uh, Quitzio, that's in Mexico. Ganey is, um, I think that's South Carolina. I know Topper is South Carolina. Sheridan Cave, I believe, is Texas. Uh, Murray Springs, <clears throat> Melrose is Pennsylvania. Um, Lingen, let's see, Kimmel Bay. It's easy enough to find out these, but they're, they're quite a widespread distribution. Now, of course, this is way back in 2013. So there've been additional sites added to this collection. This is just the sites at which these microspherals had been found as of 2013. Is there a bias on the reason why most of them are the United States or does that actually yes, point? Yes, there back is then? because okay. this is where most of the investigation has occurred. Okay. Most of the scientists that have been looking for this and most of the sites that had, um, that had samples that could be dated and examined were from the United States. But now for example, in Abu Huraria, they, Herrera, Herrera, they, uh, based upon the studies in the United States, they went back and found some scientists went back, found the uh, Younger Dryas boundary and took a look. And sure enough, they found the microspherals. So worldwide, uh, basically, is what we're talking about. At this point, we're covering about half the world. But since then, I know that uh, evidence has been found in even as far down as Antarctica. So when I when the papers came out showing that there was uh, uh, proxies in Antarctica, I pretty much concluded at that point that, yeah, it's global, it's worldwide. Now, that doesn't mean that the effects are uniformly distributed over exactly, the world. Exactly, yeah. But, but yeah, it still would have been a global event. So, now, um, um, we're kind of winding down to our last few minutes that we have. I want to get each of your thoughts on this. Matt mentioned, um, you know, magnetic pole shift. And we, we know that recently we've seen that our, uh, our magnetic north is rapidly moving towards Siberia. And we've had an increase in natural occurrences like earthquakes and volcanoes. And our weather patterns have been changing over the past few years. And I'm wondering if either of you think that we could possibly be due for another world-altering cata uh, cataclysm within our lifetime. Do you want me to go first or do you want to sure, go ahead? Okay. Why don't you go ahead, Matt? All right. So I want to just add uh, Randall's data there is, is incredible. It, it shows you that clearly we've had um, the ability for heat 
to impact the earth in such an extreme way that we mm -hmm. see the fusion of rock in a way mm -hmm. where temperatures exceeded 2000 degrees. Now mm -hmm. that's important because it really doesn't necessarily matter on the surface, whether or not it's just cosmic impacts mm -hmm. or if it's from a, a massive coronal mass ejection that allows that kind of incredible heat to reach the surface of the planet in different places. Mm -hmm. That's important, but really let's take that off the table for a moment. And let's simply consider the fact that let's go to a place like uh, Luxor, Egypt with the Colossi of Memnon. We mm -hmm. find these two massive stone statues right that or that stand in 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 place they're still there today but the interesting aspect of the colossi of memnon is that they both have vitrification or melting on the northeast sides okay and that's uh -huh. really interesting because it shows us that that heat in that event came from the northeast side okay and we and then we also look in places like egypt abu sir and other areas we find other in in peru as well we find other vitrification of some of these meg megalithic sites that shows shows that they melted or were scarred by such extreme heat we're talking about something on the surface that if humans were there they would have likely been vaporized and mm -hmm. it's interesting how oh, yeah. You, you, and you see uh, massive underground city areas like Darren Kuyu that have been built to house over like 20,000 people with air shafts and these massive stone uh, doorways that could be rolled across to completely block off and allow these civilizations to exist down there. And it really brings up the question of these events were so extreme that they were, they literally would made the surface of the planet in a lot of different places, completely unlivable and inhospitable to the mm -hmm. fact, to the point where if you were there, you would have just instantly disappeared and died just because of how extreme those events were, which is why we see so many interesting stories. I mean, Randall's going to be going down in the Southwest United States. And of course the Hopi have great traditions and stories and their legends about how they were led into underground caves by the ant people, which I think were just a group of um, higher beings or just ascended, ascended teachers that led them down into caves to survive these events, which really echoes the same thought process as a Darren Kuyu. So let's uh, go forward now to our time period we're in now, as Chris brought up. Having said that, we're almost exactly 13,000 years ago since the Younger Dryas event. Now, as Chris has pointed out, magnetic north has been moving rapidly towards Siberia. We've seen an increase in volcanism around the world to a degree where it's impressive enough that during our history, we have to look at it and, and wonder a little bit about it, whether or not all these events are related. We've seen potential salinity changes in, in, the, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean that some are worried that could disrupt the Gulf Stream with the balance of fresh and salt water pointing towards the fact that these events seem to also have a, a major play uh, pl role with the currents of the world in relation to ice, uh, ice sheet formation and then the rapid uh, uh, ending of, of those time periods to a warmer Earth time period. So when we look at all of that, we look at the, the movement of magnetic north, we look at increase in volcanism and earthquakes and, and climatic changes around the planet. And of course, those are blamed on human activity which Randall and I both sort of laugh at looking at ice cores and, and looking at how we've had r rises and dips in the past history before known industrialization of humans that is pales in comparison to now. I, I do firmly believe that we're in the middle or coming towards one of these events is again. Now, I want to just add to those who may be very fearful of that statement to th that I am actually very optimistic when I've been looking at certain, the, the certain aspects of how some components of geoengineering of reflecting solar particles back into space, as well as potentially some things like Nikola Tesla technology that may be being utilized in places like Antarctica with, a, with a, a protecting and affecting the electromagnetic, geomagnetic aspect of or the, or the balance of the poles on the earth. I, I do believe that this is well known within certain sects of higher government and is being secretly um, uh, prevented. And I, th I do believe if you look at how the ancient traditions about looking forward into time period of human history and how this current time period is discussed by some ancient cultures, like the Maya, as being a civilization that reaches the next stage that maybe potentially other civilizations have not. 
And I, I attribute that to the idea that we may have certain technologies present to us that no other civilization of these master or lost civilizations had access to. And we may be the, the first civilization to prevent our own demise and reset that has ever occurred here. And that maybe come into the idea of why Aquarius in, mm. in this time period of the next 50 to 70 mm. years may play such a significant role in our story. And so I just want to point out that I do think that there are certain technologies and things that are happening right now that may be quietly being used to prevent the younger, uh, an event that seems to happen on the 13,000 year cycle. And it would be very mm. interesting to think that, uh, those in higher positions of power already know something is going on, and it could be attributed to some of the agendas we see going on right now. Very interesting. I don't know. What are your thoughts, Randall? Well, you know, I have mixed feelings. My thought is, you know, I started studying into this kind of stuff literally in high school. So, you know, some of the people that I used to think knew more than I did about some of these things are no longer here. And Maybe I'm not quite as impressed now as I was when I was younger with their accomplishments. Although, you know, there's many people that I still hold in very high regard and high esteem. But I have searched high and low through the archives for hints and indications that there is someone who has got this figured out. And I'm not willing to say ruled out no. I don't think that it's possible. Uh, in fact, I like to believe that there's still you know, somebody out there that really knows what's going on. And sooner or later, hey, I might get to meet him and go, hey, could you explain a few things to me? Um, <clears throat> but, you know, as the years go on and I get older, I, you know, when you're a young man, you can look forward and you know, okay, you know, there, there's older guys out there, well, like me, who's been studying this shit for a long time, you know. And I know a few things, probably more than the average bear, but at the same time, there's a lot of gaps and holes in my knowledge that, I, you know, I'm hoping that I can put some more pieces together while I still have some time left. But I guess my point is, is the older I've gotten and the more I learn, the less I'm inclined to believe that there is somebody out there who's got it figured out only because when I look at the political leadership we've got now, I'm like, well, I don't think it's Joe Biden. I don't think he's Definitely got not. more uh, figured out about this, um, Oh, and I don't think it's Kamala Harris either or Nancy Pelosi. Now, these are the three top tiers of American government today. Three puppets. Yeah. Yeah. So but then I go, OK, well, who are who are the puppet masters and what did they know? My thought is they may know a whole lot more about economics than I do um, and, and political science, perhaps. But I don't know if they necessarily know more about history than I do or about some of these we want to, if we want to call them fringe topics, because within the mainstream framework of thinking, the thing kind of things that we look into are considered fringe topics. Now, interestingly, things that were uh, considered very fringe a couple of decades ago aren't so fringe anymore. You know, when, when the Younger Dries Boundary got proposed in 2007, there was a whole cadre of scientists that closed ranks to basically completely discredit the idea. And of course, when you look at it, you can see that there were political motivations there. And we probably don't have time to get into all of that right now and why political motivation would be um, find uh, the idea of some kind of a cosmic event or a cosmic impact, however you want to characterize it being the cause. Because right now, like we've all just kind of referenced uh, in this conversation, I think we're all agreeing that you know, we're being presented now with a manufactured climate crisis that wants to blame some, we're in the middle of some unprecedented climatic event now that's our fault. And because it's our fault and it's the result of our activity, our activities have to be controlled. That's in a nutshell what this is all about. Exactly. And, you know, I'm not convinced that those people really know what's going on. You know, I, I, I'm open. If you can present to me evidence that there is somebody like, you know, maybe an underground group, some, you know, somebody that, you know, and in my mind at this point, yeah, it's probably got to be some, you know, underground base or somebody on the moon. That's, uh, uh, you know, cause I go, okay, I'm 71 years old now. And, you know, if I could go for another 50 or hundred years and keep my intellectual faculties intact, what could I know? 
What could have Einstein have known? What could any of these, you know, a, a smart thinking people, intellectual people, how much could those of us who are thinkers, you know, I'm not especially smart, but I'm smarter than the average. Okay. Yeah. I admit that it's not my arrogance or ego. I'm just, it's just a simple fact, but okay. If, if, if smart, educated people could live for another, let's say double our modern, our present day lifespan and keep our fa uh, functions uh, intact, you know, what could we know? I mean, what a waste. I've been thinking, geez, I'm just getting to the point where I'm starting to figure things out and I'm supposed <laughs> to be going, wait a minute now, I've only got what, a couple of decades left at the best. Oh. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, listen, there's, here's, here's, we, we circle back to this idea of the grail and the idea of restoration, because that is, I think, a very real part of this ancient knowledge, Matt, that you were referring to. And that, you know, you said we, I forget the words you used, but what was invoking in my mind was this idea that I've drawn from biblical studies, which is the curse, the curse that came upon the human species that whose manifestation was the expulsion from paradise, from the garden. And yeah. we see that curse replayed again in the in the the murder of of um, Abel by uh, Cain, we see it again in the in the great flood. It's the curse that comes upon the earth, and it's a curse. I think that ultimately we have the power to break that curse. Yeah, and I think that you mentioned several things. You mentioned Tesla. He was onto some things. Victor Schauberger was onto some things. Wil Wilhelm Reich was onto some things. Other researchers have been on to things that I think each one of these is like a strand of the thread that if we weave it together, we're going to see this tapestry of our own past. And again, the grail, I think, is now a symbol for that lost technology. And circling back to that, and then I'll mention, you know, that's going to be the theme that unites these two weekends from Easter weekend to Earth Day weekend and the and the excursions that we're going to take into Hopi land and some very interesting places in the interim. Um, pictographic places, uh, rock art that's normally not accessible to the public. But we're in a privileged position because, you know, a lot of these tribes are concerned that their young people, their young millennials aren't going to necessarily effectively carry on their traditional stories. And so they're more open now than they were a generation ago to sharing their stories with outsiders. So I'm privileged to be in a position where we're going to have attending this, these, this two weekends of events in Sedona, um, both a Hopi storyteller and a Zuni storyteller. And glad you're doing that. Yeah. And, and I will just share, let's see here. What have I got here? Do I have, I'll share. Um, how much time we got left, Chris? Yeah, go, go for it. I want to say, while you're pulling that up, it was definitely an honor to have, these two generations of amazing researchers here tonight to share their knowledge and insights into our incredible history that's been hidden. <clears throat> and this is what we need. We need more discussions like this going forward. And this is the only way we're going to find out the truth about our hidden history. And I want to thank both of you gentlemen for taking the time to do this again tonight. This was fantastic. Well, thanks for hosting it, Chris. Of I've enjoyed course. I think this is our third time together. Is that right? Yeah, 34th, one of those, yeah. Yeah, well, I've enjoyed it, and uh, I'm sure you've got a great audience. And um, I'd like to invite people, check out, you can go to randallcarlson.com, or you can go, if you'll see here, worldviews, with a Z, media.com. That's Robert Dakota, who's hosting, who's organizing the event. But there's a whole bunch of stuff going on with some really cool people. And if you go here, you can find out more about it. Obviously, this is me, and that's Graham Hancock, and this is George Howard. Um, as I said, he's one of the leading researchers on uh, Younger Dryas catastrophism in the world today. And we're going to be there sharing ideas, and we've got some really incredible guests. Spencer Taylor, a young man who's just finished seven years uh, post-production right now of his documentary called The End of Recess, which is about the basically the collapse and demise of uh modern education and uh alternatives so that's going to be a big part of the theme of of the two weekends we've got dave matheson who's coming in who's showing how all of the ancient planet star lores all uh synthesized into a grand integral scheme of things it's truly amazing stuff so we will be getting out 
under the night sky with him while he tells us and brings in the star lore from ancient cultures from all over the world and shows these remarkable parallels um, between ancient, how ancient people uh, interpreted the sky. Um, well, yeah. So yeah. who else? A number of other people. It's going to be very interesting. And there's a, you know, the whole thing may be, I, I don't know, it, to me, it's not expensive because, uh, but it's Sedona, Arizona. We're going to be at um, a couple of really cool places where we're going to be staying Paco, Poco Diablo um, in Sedona, but um, there's multiple packages and there's also going to be a live stream. We're going to live stream the thing. So if you can't actually get there in person, there's going to be a live stream. And if you, if you sign up for one weekend, you get the live stream for both weekends forever. So that's kind of a cool deal. Um, but yeah, there's different, different, um, uh, options available. So just check it out. And, you know, if you can't get there, then do the live stream and it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. jam, jam yeah. packed. It's going to be a really concentrated, uh, dose of information. And we're hoping that out of this, we're really trying to galvanize a global movement here. And that's kind of ultimately what this is all about. That's great, and man. what a great place to for a launch pad, Sedona, Arizona. I appreciate you uh, fostering that collaboration of great minds to come together to create this synergy of changing the consciousness and the planet to start looking at all of this in a different light. So thank you, Randall. Hey, yes. you're welcome. Listen, I can't think of anything to me more interesting and fun to do than that. So <laughs> me either. I agree. Exactly. Well, this, is, this has been fantastic. I want to, like I said, thank you, gentlemen, both again for coming on, taking time to do this. This is what we need more of. We need more meetings of these wonderful minds to to get more of our information about our hidden past. Like I said, and uh, I hope that maybe we can do this sometime again in the near future because this was awesome, and I think we barely scratch the surface of some of this stuff. There's so much more we could cover. Yeah, yeah, Chris, and I. I Go yeah. ahead, go ahead, Randall. Well, I'll just, just I'll say quickly words. that um yeah, I want people to to, to just randallcarlson.com will get you to my website because we are actively looking for the prime perfect piece of real estate to launch the first prototype. And it's this is where we're in fact even it's gotten the, the, the interest has grown to the point now where we're probably gonna have to we're gonna do two. You know, I've been a builder for four decades and I built millions, millions of dollars of, of buildings, um, and scattered for a whole bunch of owners scattered all over. And now I want to bring it all together and put all of the things that I've learned about sacred geometry and sacred architecture and the ancient template, um, bring all of that together, fused with modern technology and begin to build because I believe that there are times in history, just like you were talking about, Matthew, these periodic times where there's catastrophes. I think there's periodic times where there's uh, concentrated uh, regeneration of things. We can go back to the, you know, to the 11, 1200s, and we see like suddenly the whole of Europe comes together to build these great monuments to the glory of man and God, right? These great cathedrals. These leaps, right? These great leaps. Leaps, leaps yes. I think we're standing on the threshold right now of a leap. And part of what this seminar and this, this conference is about is what is going to be our cathedrals for our age, for our okay. generation. Yeah. What do we do to carry on this great work that goes back to the dawn of history and beyond? Standing on the backs of giants, truly. When we pick up our trowel, that's what it's about. It's time once again to pick up the trowel and go to work. I love that. That's really beautiful, Randall. And can I just say thank you so much, Chris, for hosting this. It's been truly an honor to work with you, Randall. Um, I really appreciate everything you're doing, and I appreciate the knowledge that you've obtained over so many countless years of studying. So thank you so much for all you're doing to contribute to our story and the human race, well, thanks, because you are people like you are integral into this age of moving into these leaps of higher consciousness when, hey, if we can survive and get through one of these resets, who yeah, knows yeah. where the human story can go? What That's is the right. potential of our story and, yes. and the potential of us? What is the potential? And I say that the potential is beyond anything we're almost even capable of imagining at this point. And we truly will become gods, just like we've always studied all along from the very past. Yeah. 
So I just want to say thank you so much, Chris. And for anyone interested in my work, you can find mine at thestageoftime.com or my YouTube channel, Matthew LaCroix. And I truly hope that, Randall, you and I can have another conversation in the future. Yeah, well, hey, man, we should hang out in the field. I'd love to take you out and begin to reveal the hidden messages of the landscape to you. That would be awesome. I'm in Colorado, so I'm not that far. And perhaps we can meet up sometime. That would be truly an honor to work with you again. Oh, that'd be, it'd be great. Yeah. Well, there's places right in Colorado we could go visit. Absolutely. And I could show you things. And yeah. Okay. Let's, yeah. let's do it. Absolutely. Anytime, Randall. I'm, I'm available anytime for you, my friend. All right. For sure. And I'm, I might try and make it out to your event there in uh, Sedona. I'm in Colorado as well. And I, you know, okay. I'd love to give you some publicity for it as well. So, so that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, this is really, I also mentioned that this is a fundraiser. I mean, the money we make off this is going into the pool that's going to be, ah, we've got a heavy rainstorm just just came in here Perfect as you guys timing. were talking. As Chris was talking, I heard the thunder. Yeah. Um, that was very impressive, Chris. So, but my point is, we this is going to be a fundraiser. And um the people who are interested will be having a newsletter. I have a newsletter that goes out every month that's kind of to keep people up, but we're going to have a special focused newsletter to anybody who's interested in this specific project. So as we're going out to scout land, for example, for looking for sites for this place, we'll do a, a newsletter talking about this to keep people up to speed on what we're doing. If we go ahead and we, you know, get, we purchase a piece of land, um, and we're going to explain the whole process right from the beginning, doing the geomantic survey to set, putting the, the pole in the ground, the, 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 the omphalos, laying out the cosmic angles, creating the juxtaposing of the cosmic template on the land, and then how we create using sacred geometry, the infrastructure to emerge from the earth almost as an organic living thing. And then that will be the place where people can now come together and share their minds and thoughts and it. so on. Bring the great mystery schools back once again, right? Yes. Yeah. You nailed it. That's it. Exactly. Exactly. I love that, man. That is fantastic. Well, like I said, gentlemen, we are going to have to do this again. We barely scratched the surface of this, some of this stuff, so I'd love to speak with both of you again soon. Uh, Matt, I know we'll be talking again in the future. And Absolutely. In Yes, definitely. This was great. Until next time, everyone, have an excellent evening. We will be talking again tomorrow as well.